Remember, you can hit Shift Tab to get all the information, right? Transforms by default um, will flip randomly um, each image, right? But um, they'll actually randomly only flip them horizontally, which makes sense, right? If you're trying to tell if something's a cat or a dog, it doesn't matter whether it's pointing left or right, but you wouldn't expect it to be upside down. On the other hand, satellite imagery, whether something's cloudy or hazy or whether there's a road there or not, could absolutely be flipped upside down. There's no such thing as a right way up from space. So flip vert, which defaults to false, we're going to flip over to true to say like, yeah, randomly, you should actually do that. And it doesn't just flip it vertically. It actually tries also each possible 90 degree rotation. So there are eight possible uh, kind of symmetries that it tries out. Um, so there's various other things here. Um, uh, I found that uh, these particular settings work pretty well for um, planet. Um, one that's interesting is um, warp. Um, perspective warping is something which uh, very few libraries provide, and those that do provide it, it tends to be really slow. I think FastAI is the first, what, first one to provide really fast pers uh, perspective warping. And basically, the reason this is interesting is if I kind of look at you from below versus look at you from above, um, the kind of your shape changes, right? And so when you're taking a, a photo of a cat or a dog, um, you know, sometimes you'll be higher, sometimes you'll be lower, then that kind of change of shape is certainly something that you would want to include uh, as you're creating your, your training batches. You want to, mod want to modify it a little bit each time. Um, not true for satellite images. A satellite always points straight down at the planet. Uh, so if you added perspective warping, you would be making changes that um, aren't going to be there in real life. So I turn that off. So this is all something called data augmentation. We'll be talking a lot more about it um, later in the course. Um, but you can start to get a feel for the kinds of things that you can do to, to augment your data. And in general, maybe the most important one is if you're looking at astronomical data or kind of pathology, you know, um, digital slide data or satellite data, you know, data where there isn't really an up or a down, um, turning on flip vert equals true is generally going to make your models generalize better. Okay, so um, here's the steps necessary to create our um, data bunch. Um, and so now to create a um, satellite imagery um, classifier, multi-label classifier, that's going to figure out for each uh, satellite tile what's the weather and what else, what can I see in it, there's basically nothing else to learn. Everything else that you've already learnt is going to be exactly nearly the same. Uh, here it is, learn equals create CNN, data, architecture, right? And in this case, when I first uh, built, built this notebook, I used ResNet 34 as per usual, um, and I found this was a case, I tried ResNet 50 as I always like to do, I found ResNet 50 helped a little bit, and I had some time to run it, so in this case I was using ResNet 50. Um, there's uh, one more change I make, which is metrics. Now, to remind you, a metric has got nothing to do with how the model trains. Changing your metrics will not change your resulting model at all. The only thing that we use metrics for is we print them out during training. See so here, it's printing out accuracy and it's printing out this other metric called F beta. So, um, if you're trying to figure out how to do a better job with your model, changing the metrics will never be something that you need to do there. They're just to show you how you're going. Um, so that's the first thing to know. Uh, you can have one metric or no metrics or a list of multiple metrics um, uh, to be printed out as your model's training. Um, in this case, I want to know two things. The first thing I want to know is the accuracy, and the second thing I want to know is how would I go on Kaggle? And Kaggle told me that I'm going to be judged on a particular metric called the F-score. So I'm not going to bother telling you about the F-score. It's not really interesting enough to be worth spending your time on. You can look it up. Um, but it's, it's basically this. When you have a classifier, um, you're going to have some false positives. You're going to have some false negatives. How do you weigh up those two things to kind of create a single number? There's lots of different ways of doing that. And something called the F-score um, is, a, is basically a nice way of combining that into a single number. Um, and there are various kinds of F scores, F1, F2, and so forth. And um, Kaggle said uh, in the competition rules, we're going to use a metric called F2. So 
Um, we have um, uh, a metric called F beta, which is, in other words, it's F with one or two or whatever, depending on the value of beta. And we can have a look at its signature, and you can see that um, it's got a threshold and a beta. Okay, so the beta is two by default, and Kaggle said that we're gonna, they're gonna use F2, so I don't have to change that. But there's one other thing uh, that I need to set, which is a threshold. Um, what does that mean? Well, here's the thing. Do you remember we had a little look the other day at the source code for the accuracy metric? So if you put two question marks, you get the source code. And we found that it used this thing called argmax. And the reason for that, if you remember, was we, we kind of had this, you know, input image that came in and it went through our model and at the end it came out with a table of 10 numbers, right? This is like if we're doing MNIST digit recognition and the 10 numbers were like the probability of each of the possible digits. And so then we had to look through all of those and find out which one was the biggest. And so that, the, the function in NumPy or PyTorch or just math notation that finds the biggest and returns its index is called argmax, right? So to get the accuracy for our pet detector, we use this accuracy function that called argmax to find out behind the scenes which class ID pet was the one that we're looking at. And then it compared uh, that to the actual and then took the average, and that was the, um, that was the accuracy. We can't do that for satellite uh, recognition in this case because there isn't one label we're looking for. There's lots. So instead, what we do is we look at, so in this case, so um, I don't know if you remember, but a data bunch has a special attribute called C. And C is gonna be uh, basically how many outputs do we want our model to create? And so for any kind of classifier, we want one probability for each possible class. So in other words, data.c for classifiers is always gonna be equal to the length of data.classes, right? So data.classes, there they all are, there's the 17 possibilities, right? So they're, they're the, we're gonna have one, probability for each of those. But then we're not just gonna pick out one of those 17, we're gonna pick out n of those 17. And so what we do is we compare each probability to some threshold. And then we say anything that's higher than that threshold, we're gonna assume that the model's saying it does have that feature. And so we can pick that threshold. Um, uh, I found that for this particular data set, a threshold of 0.2 seems to generally work pretty well. This is the kind of thing you can easily just experiment to find a good threshold. So I decided I wanted to print out the accuracy at a threshold of 0.2. So um, the normal accuracy function doesn't work that way. It doesn't argmax. We have to use a different accuracy function called accuracy underscore thresh. And that's the one that's gonna compare every probability to a threshold and return all the things higher than that threshold and compare accuracy that way. And so one of the things we would pass in is thresh. Now, of course, our metric is gonna be calling our function for us, so we don't get to tell it every time, every time it calls back what threshold do we want. So we really wanna create a special version of this function that always uses an accuracy of a threshold of 0.2. So one way to do that would be to go uh, define something called accuracy 02 that takes some input and some target and returns um, accuracy threshold with that input and that target and a threshold of 0.2. We could do it that way, right? But it's so common that you wanna kind of say, create a new function that's just like that other function, but we're always gonna call it with a particular parameter. That computer science has a term for that. It's called a partial. It's called a partial function application. And so Python 3, uh, has uh, something called partial that takes some function and some list of keywords and values and creates a new function 
that is exactly the same as this function, but is always going to call it with that keyword argument. So here, this is exactly the same thing as the thing I just typed in. ACK02 is now a new function that calls accuracy thresh with a threshold of 0.2. And so this is a really common thing to do, particularly with the fast AI library, because there's lots of places where you have to pass in functions, and you very often want to pass in a slightly customized version of a function, so that here's how you do it. So here I've got an accuracy threshold 0.2, I've got a um, F beta threshold 0.2, I can pass them both in as metrics, and I can then go ahead and do all the normal stuff. LR find, recorder.plot, find the thing with the steepest slope, so I don't know, somewhere around 1 in egg 2, so we'll make that our learning rate, and then fit for a while with 5 comma slice LR, and see how we go. Okay, and so we've got an accuracy of about 96%, and an F beta of about 0.926, um, and so you could then go and have a look at planet, leaderboard, private leaderboard, okay, and so the top 50th is about 0.93, so we kind of say like, oh, we're on the right track, okay, with some, something we're doing, we're doing fine. So as you can see, like once you get to a point that the data's there, there's very little extra to do most of the time. So when your model makes an incorrect prediction in a deployed app, is there a good way to record that error and use that learning to improve the model in a more targeted way? Oh yeah, that's a great question. So the first bit, is there a way to record that? Of course there is. You record it. That's up to you, right? So maybe some of you can try it this week. Um, have, you, you need to have your user tell you you were wrong. This Australian car, you said it was a Holden, and actually it's a Falcon. Uh, so first of all, you'll need to collect that feedback, and the only way to do that is to ask the user to tell you when it's wrong. Uh, so you now need to record in some log somewhere, something saying, you know, this was the file, I've stored it here, this was the prediction I made, this was the actual, I to uh, you know, this is the actual that they told me, and then um, at the end of the day or at the end of the week, you could set up a little job to run something or you can um, manually run something. And what are you going to do? You're going to do some fine tuning. What does fine tuning look like? Good segue, Rachel. It looks like this, right? So let's pretend here's your saved model, right? And so then we unfreeze, right? And then we fit a little bit more, right? Now in this case, I'm fitting with my original data set. But you could create a new data bunch with just the misclassified instances and go ahead and fit, right? And the misclassified ones are likely to be particularly interesting, so you might want to fit at a slightly higher learning rate, you know, to make them kind of really mean more, or you might want to run them through a few more epochs. But it's exactly the same thing, right? You just uh, call fit with your misclassified examples and passing in the, the correct classification. And that should really help your model uh, quite a lot. There, there are various other tweaks you can do to this, um, but that's the basic idea. The next question, could someone talk a bit more about the data block ideology? I'm not, not quite sure how the blocks are meant to be used. Do they have to be in a certain order? Is there any other library that uses this type of programming that I could look at? Um, yes, they do have to be in a certain order. Um, um, they do have to be in a certain order, and it's basically the order that you see in the example of use, right? It's, it's um, what kind of uh, data do you have, where does it come from, how do you label it, how do you split it, what kind of data sets do you want, optionally, how do I transform it, and then how do I create a data bunch from it. Um, so they're the steps. Um, um, I, I mean, we invented this API. Um, I don't know if other people have independently invented it. Um, the basic idea of kind of a, a pipeline of things that dot into each other is, is um, pretty common um, in a, a number of uh, places. Not so much in Python, but you see it more in JavaScript. Um, although this kind of approach of like each stage produces something slightly different you don't, you tend to see it more in like um, 
ETL software, like extraction, extraction, transformation, and loading software, where there's kind of particular stages in a pipeline. So yeah, I mean, it's been inspired by a bunch of things. But um, yeah, all, all you need to know is kind of use this example to guide you, um, and then look up the documentation to see, you know, which particular kind of thing you want. And in this case, the image file list um, you're actually not going to find the documentation for image file list in Datablocks documentation because this is specific to the vision application. So to then go and actually find out uh, how to do something for your particular application, you would then go, you know, to look at text and vision and so forth, and that's where you can find out what are the Datablock API pieces available for that application. And of course, you can then look at the source code if you've got some totally new application. Uh, you could create your own um, part of any of these stages. Like, pretty much all of these functions are, you know, at very few lines of code. Um, maybe we could look at an example of one. Uh, image list dot from folder. So let's just put that somewhere temporary. Um, and then we're going to go t dot uh, label from CSV. Then you can look at the documentation to see exactly what that does, and that's going to call label from data, data frame. So, I mean, this is already, like, useful. Like, if you, you know, wanted to create a data frame, a pandas data frame from something other than the CSV, you now know that you could actually just call label from data frame, and you can look up to find what that does. And as you can see, like, most fast AI functions are no more than, you know, a few lines of code. Um, they're normally pretty pretty straightforward to see what are all the pieces there and how can you use them. Um, and I, I, it's probably one of these things that as you play around with it, you'll get a good sense of, of, of how it all gets put together. But if during the week there are particular things where you're thinking, I don't understand how to do this, please let us know and we'll try to help you. Sure. Uh, what resources do you recommend for getting started with video, um, for example, being able to pull frames and submit them to your model? Um, I, I guess, um, it's a, I mean, the answer is it depends. If you're using, um, if you're using the web, uh, which I guess probably most of you will be, um, then there's, uh, there's web APIs that basically do that for you. So you can grab the frames uh, with, uh, with the web API, and then they're just images which you can pass along. Um, if you're doing it client side, I guess most people tend to use OpenCV for that. Uh, but um, maybe people during the week could, uh, who are doing these video apps can tell us what have, what have you used and found useful, and we can start to prepare something in the lesson wiki with a list of uh, video resources, since it sounds like some people are interested. Um, okay, so just like our usual, we unfreeze our model, and then we um, fit some more, and we get down to nine to nine-ish. Um, so um, one thing to notice here is that um, where before we unfreeze, uh, you'll tend to get this shape pretty much all the time. If you do your learning rate finder before you unfreeze, and it's pretty easy, you know, find the steepest slope, not the bottom. Right? Remember, we're trying to find the bit where we can like slide down it quickly. So if you start at the bottom, it's just going to send you straight off to the end here. So somewhere around here. Um, and then we um, can call it again after you unfreeze. And you'll generally get a very different shape. Right? And this is a little bit harder to say what to look for because um, it tends to be this kind of shape where you get a little bit of upward and then a kind of very gradual downward and then up here. So. You know, I tend to kind of look for just before it shoots up and go back about 10x, right, as a kind of a rule of thumb, so 1e, neg 5, right? And that is what I do for the first half of my slice, and then for the second half of my slice, I normally do whatever learning rate I used for the, the frozen part, so LR, which was 0.01, kind of divided by 5, or divided by 10, somewhere around that. Um, so that's kind of my rule of thumb, right? Look for the bit kind of at the bottom, find about 10x smaller, that's the number that I put here, and then LR over 5 or LR over 10 is kind of what I put there. Um, seems to work most of the time. 
we'll be talking more about exactly what's going on here. This is called discriminative learning rates um, as the course continues. Um, so how am I going to get this better than 929? Because, um, you know, there are how many people in this competition? About a thousand teams, right? Uh, so we want to get into the top 10%. Um, so the top 5% would be 0.931-ish. The top 10% is going to be about 929-ish. So we're not, mm, not quite there. Right? So um, here's a trick, right? I don't know if you remember, but I, when I created my um, uh, data set, I put size equals 128. And actually the images that Kaggle gave us are 256. So I used a size of 128 partially because I wanted to experiment quickly. Uh, it's, it's much quicker and easier to use small images to experiment. But there's a second reason. I now have a model that's pretty good at recognizing the contents of 128 by 128 satellite images. So what am I going to do if I now want to create a model that's pretty good at 256 by 256 satellite images? Well, why don't I use transfer learning? Why don't I start with the model that's good at 128 by 128 images and fine tune that? So don't start again, right? And that's actually going to be really interesting because if I'm trained quite a lot, if I'm on the verge of overfitting, which I don't want to do, right? Then I'm basically creating a whole new data set effectively, one where my images are, are twice the size on each axis, right? So four times bigger. So it's really a totally different data set as far as my convolutional neural network's concerned. So I kind of gonna lose all that overfitting. I get to start again. So let's create a new learner, right? Well, I mean, let's, let's keep our same learner but use a new data bunch where the data bunch is 256 by 256. So that's why I actually stopped here, right? Before I created my data sets. Because I'm gonna now take this this data source, and I'm going to create a new data bunch with 256 instead. So let's have a look at how we do that. So here it is. Take that source, right? Take that source, transform it with the same transforms as before, but this time use size 256. Right? Now that should be better anyway, because this is going to be, you know, higher resolution images. But also I'm going to start with, I haven't got rid of my learner. It's the same learner I had before. So I'm going to start with this kind of pre-trained model. And so I'm going to replace the data inside my learner with this new data bunch. And then I will freeze again. So that means I'm going back to just training the last few layers. And I will do a new LR find. And because I actually now have a pretty good model, like it's pretty good for 128 by 128, um, so it's probably going to be like at least okay for 256 by 256. I don't get that same sharp shape that I did before. But I can certainly see where it's way too high, right? So I'm going to pick something well before where it's way too high. Again, maybe 10x smaller. So here I'm going to go 1e e neg 2 over 2. That's, you know, seems well before it shoots up. And so let's fit a little bit more. Okay, so we've frozen again. So we're just training the last few layers and fit a little bit more. And as you can see, I very quickly, remember kind of 928 was where we got to before after quite a few epochs. We're straight up there and suddenly we've passed 0.93. Right, so we're now already kind of into the top 10%. So we've hit our first goal, right? We're doing, we're, we're at the very least pretty competent at the problem of recognizing satellite imagery. But of course now, we can do the same thing before. We can unfreeze and train a little more. Okay, again, using the same kind of approach I described before, LR over five here, an even smaller one here, train a little bit more, 0.9314. So that's actually pretty good, 0.931. Somewhere around top 20-ish. So you can see actually when um, my friend Brendan and I entered this competition, we came 22nd with 0.9315 and we spent, this was a year or two ago, months 
trying to get here. So using kind of pretty much, you know, defaults with some minor tweaks and one trick, which is the resizing tr tr uh, tweak, you can kind of get right up into the top of the leaderboard of this very challenging competition. Now, I should say, um, we, we don't really know where we'd be. We'd actually have to check it on the test set that Kaggle gave us and actually submit to the competition, which you can do. You can do a late submission. And so later on um, uh, in the course, we'll learn how to do that. Um, but we certainly know where we're doing well. You know, we're doing, we're doing very well. Um, so that's great news. Um, and so you can see also as I kind of go along, I tend to save things. I just, I, you can name your models whatever you like, but I just want to basically know, you know, was it kind of before or after the unfreeze? So I kind of had stage one or two. What size was I training on? What architecture was I training on? So that way I can kind of always go back and experiment um, pretty easily. Uh, so that's, that's planet, uh, multi-label classification. Um, let's look at another example. Um, so um, another, the other example next we're going to look at is um, this data set called Canvid, and it's going to be doing something called segmentation. We're going to start with a picture like this, and we're going to try and create a color-coded picture like this, where all of the bicycle pixels are the same color, all of the road line pixels are the same color, all of the tree pixels are the same color, all of the building pixels are the same color, the sky is the same color, and so forth. Okay? Now, we're not actually going to make them colors. We're actually going to do it um, where each of those pixels has a unique number. So in this case, the top left is building, so I guess building is number four. The top right is tree, so tree is 26, and so forth. All right? So in other words, this single top left pixel, we're basically, like imagine this, we're going to do a classification problem, just like the pets classification, for the very top left pixel. We're going to say, what is that top left pixel? Is it bicycle, road lines, sidewalk, building? What is the very top left pixel? And then, what is the next pixel along? What is the next pixel along? So we're going to do a little classification problem for every single pixel in every single image. So that's called segmentation. Right? Um, in order to build a segmentation model, you actually need to, to download or create a data set where someone has actually labeled every pixel. So as you can imagine, that's a lot of work. Okay, so this is, um, so that's gonna be a lot of work. You're probably not gonna create your own segmentation data sets, but you're probably gonna download or find them from somewhere else. This is very common in, um, Medicine, life sciences, you know, if you're looking through um, uh, slides at nuclei, it's very likely you already have a whole bunch of segmented cells and segmented nuclei. If you're in radiology, you probably already have lots of examples of segmented lesions and so forth. So there's a lot of, um, you know, uh, 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 kind of different domain areas where there are domain-specific tools for creating these segmented images. Um, as you could guess from this example, uh, it's also very common in um, kind of self-driving cars and stuff like that, uh, where you need to see, you know, what, what objects are around and where are they. So, in this case, there's a nice uh, data set uh, called Canvid, uh, which we can um, download, and they have already got a whole bunch of images and segment masks prepared for us, um, which is pretty cool. And remember, um, pretty much all of the data sets that we have provided kind of inbuilt URLs for, um, you can see their details at course.fasted.ai slash datasets. And um, nearly all of them are academic data sets where some very kind people have gone to all of this trouble for us so that we can use this data set and made it available um, for us to use. So if you do use it, one of these data sets for any kind of project, it would be very, very nice uh, if you were to go and find the citation and say, you know, thanks to these people for this data set, okay? Because uh, they've, they've provided it, uh, and all they're asking in return is, is for us to give them that credit, okay? So here is the Canva data set, here is the citation, and on our data sets page, that will link to the academic paper where it came from. 
Okay, Rachel, now is a good time for a question. Is there a way to use learn.lr find and have it return a suggested number directly rather than having to plot it as a graph and then pick a learning rate by visually inspecting that graph? And then there are a few other questions I think around more guidance on reading the learning rate finder graph. 